infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. Now, in this short Q&A, I'm going to go ahead and talk to Associate Professor of Infectious Diseases and International Medicine at USF Health, Sandra Gumpf, MD, about one of her infectious disease pearls. That's tetanus. Take a listen. Let's talk about tetanus. Um, what is it, and how is it contracted? Yes. Um, tetanus is caused by the bacteria Clostridium tetani, and it is a, a toxin-mediated disease. And Clostridium tetani uh, produces a toxin. Um, it may uh, uh, contaminate a wound, uh, and that's how the toxin uh, gains entry. The toxin is called tetanospasmin. And what it does is it enters the neuromuscular junction um, through the blood and the lymphatics. And then it reaches the central nervous system by retrograde axonal transport. It, it creeps up along the nervous, the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system. And what it does is it blocks release of GABA, uh, that GABA butyric acid at the synapse. And so there's no inhibition of reflex, of neuronal reflexes, and there's just a feedback loop of spasm. So you have an unimpeded uh, muscle spasm, uh, even with minimal levels of stim stimulus. So as you might imagine, it uh, causes uh, severe spasm and uh, a lot of other uh, symptoms. Yeah, and let's follow up on that. What, are, what symptoms are typical for tetanus? Yeah, so uh, tetanus is characterized by severe and painful tetanic spasms, the recurrent and uh, unrelenting spasms. Mostly of the skeletal muscles, it, it can affect the entire body. Uh, it doesn't affect uh, the thinking or consciousness. Uh, so it's, all, it's entirely uh, uh, the big muscles. Uh, you, uh, sometimes the spasms will begin or often the spasms will begin in the head and neck. So the chewing muscles, the masseter muscles of the jaw may uh, cause the first symptoms, and that's where you get the name lockjaw. Right. And it may, the whole thing may progress to be so severe uh, as to cause uh, widespread uh, muscle spasm so that the, the body, the entire body bends backwards. That's called opisthotonus. Um, the, that kind of spasm can tear muscles or even break bones in some cases. Uh, fortunately, we don't see a whole lot of that here because we have a uh, vaccine, but other, other parts of the world can uh, see severe tetanus uh, of that level. Um, and people may have drooling. They may have loss of uh, bowel and bladder control. It's not unusual. And usually death happens related to uh, lack of oxygen to the brain because of asphyxia. Uh, prolonged, the spasms are very prolonged, and, and they may, patients may not be able to breathe. Uh, sometimes they can aspirate, they can develop sepsis, and cardiac failure. Um, so it's, it's just an agonizing disease, and 25% of its um, victims die. Sure. And unfortunately, more so, it's, it's neonates. Yeah. Um and as you said, it is a vaccine-preventable disease. Um, mm -hmm. But for those that are not vaccinated, how is it treated? Um, well, it is treated with um, an antitoxin. Um, it is preventable uh, with vaccine. And for in the U.S., we have primarily pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, it's given as part of the primary childhood vaccinations, and it's followed up every 10 years with a booster. Uh, and if uh, someone has a tetanus-prone wound, uh, they will be, and they, 
they've had more than five years since the, their last booster vaccine, they get a booster. Uh, a tetanus prone wound would be a wound that's been over six hours old or it's deeper than a centimeter. It's a bite, uh, frostbite uh, is considered tetanus prone. And um, more importantly, nowadays, since there is a trend toward non-vaccination uh, in developed countries, uh, if the primary ser series was never received, then those uh, individuals should get tetanus uh, immune globulin, along with uh, starting a primary vaccine mm -hmm. series. Okay, you, you previously mentioned neonatal tetanus. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? It's not, that's really not something we see in the U.S., but other countries we do. Right. Um, in the U.S., it's uh, virtually unheard of, mm -hmm. uh, if not unheard of. Uh, but in the developing world uh, where mothers are not vaccinated, uh, there may be uh, cutting of the umbilical cord with unsterile instrument, instruments, uh, there's significant uh, morbidity and mortality. Uh, there's contam uh, any contamination of the umbilical stump with uh, dirt can uh, lead to neonatal tetanus. Uh, neonatal mortality is about 14-15 percent uh, due to tetanus. Now one of the topics we cover frequently on this program is rabies and um, in uh, your ID pearls, you, you talk about how tetanus and rabies are similar. Yes, um, they can be similar. And, you know, when you are uh, faced with a patient with these symptoms and you're formulating your differential diagnosis, uh, it can be helpful to remember that those, are, are, those two are possible. Uh, both of them are associated with bites, uh, animal bites. Both of them can cause drooling. Uh, and both of them uh, can be associated with a clear sensorium. You know, since they are both uh, toxin-mediated, they don't really affect consciousness. Uh, they, uh, they block uh, neurotransmitters rather than causing uh, overt poisoning or toxicity. Uh, both of them can have uh, violent episodes such as titanic spasm and you know, people with rabies can have hydrophobia with uh, head and neck spasm with any kind of uh, stimulus. And the incubation period for either of them can be weeks or months. Uh, so they may not recall a particular exposure. Mm -hmm. Both of them are preventable by uh, vaccine before the onset of in, uh, illness. Right. 